to this edition of Pizza and Politics, the 2012 Debate Watches. My name is Linda Peek Schacht, and just four years ago, in my first semester at Lipscomb, we thought we'd try something called Pizza and Politics and have people come and watch the debate with us. And it was a success, and tonight, the fact that you're here shows that it was right for us to do it again. Many of you have joined us during the last four years as we've done other pizza and politics editions. And don't worry, you'll still be getting emails from Leah Davis, who organizes all this for us, uh, as we continue to do this even after the election and into the inauguration and the first year of whoever the next president is. We are really honored tonight to have a key and stellar group of, of, of panelists who I'll introduce in just a moment. But you'll all remember that one part of Pizza and Politics, the Debate Watch edition, uh, is the clicker technology to find out what you think. So I'm very pleased to bring back Dr. Jimmy McCollum, known as Dr. Mack, here on campus, who was uh, your guide through the polls four years ago and will be our guide again tonight. Dr. Mack? Thank you. Thank you very much. We have given about 90 or 95 of you some clickers, some response cards. If for any reason you would rather tweet or not uh, participate, that is okay. Just hold it up and there are, may, I think, some others that are sitting around the room. If you'd like to pass it to somebody else, uh, somebody else can come get yours. If you'll look at your card, you'll see a series of uh, letters and numbers on them. Uh, we will start with some demographic information uh, to get us warmed up. Our first question uh, will be, please identify yourself. So you see one button that says one or A, a button that says two or B for male or female. You can see that so we have 76, 77 responses. Uh, we'll give you time to get acquainted and to figure out the answer to this question. And we'll close the poll in about uh, five seconds. All right, pretty even, 55% females. The next question, how old are you? We would kind of like to see how many of you will be in your first presidential election. Uh, so if, you, if that is appropriate to you, press number one or letter A. We're about to close the poll. All right, 70% of you are experiencing your first presidential election. 7% 22 to 30, and about a quarter of you 31 or older. We have gotten several of these questions from the Pew Research Center. Most of these questions will be opinions. There's no right or wrong answer. Uh, there are a few questions that will be right or wrong, but we want to see what your thoughts are uh, approaching this presidential election. So our next question is, are you registered to vote? Press A for yes, B for no. There is a right answer. <laughs> and we're about to close the poll. 82% are registered, so some of you have some work to do pretty soon. The deadline is October 8th. Thank you very much. Just a few more days, a few more days, October 8th. Next question. How certain are you that you will vote in the upcoming presidential election? How certain are you that you will vote in the upcoming election? Absolutely certain, press A. Fairly certain, press B. Not certain, press C. And about to close the poll. All right, 65%, absolutely certain. Still quite a few fairly certain. A 19%, not certain at all. This issue has been in the news lately. Have you been affected by your state's voter ID laws? Yes, press A. No, press B. And about to close the poll. 
89% uh, no, 11% yes. If you will, please identify your party affiliation. Uh, do you typically align yourself with the Democratic Party? Press A. Republican Party, press B. Independent C. Libertarian D. Tea Party E. If there's something else, press the 6 or the F. And we're about to close. Let's see what we have. All right, 27% Democrat, 40%. Uh, we have every, everything represented tonight, so this will be interesting. 40% Republican, etc. I see that there are about eight or nine of you who are just choosing not to, uh, to vote, and that's, that's fine. If, if you have a clicker on your table that's not being used, maybe hold it up. And if somebody else wants to uh, make use of it, uh, come on down and get these. We'll, we'll try to get as many different uh, voters, participants as possible. Keep raising your hands, if you will. We'd appreciate it. Well, we'll get some more votes. Next question. How much thought have you given this presidential election? Quite a bit. Press A. Some thought. Press B. Very little. Press C. How engaged have you been so far? Oh, good. We have lots, of, lots more voters. 92 of you now. We'll close the poll. All right, just over half have stated quite a lot of thought gone into this. 29% some, 17% not very much thought at all. Maybe tonight can help. All right, I said that um, there were some questions that were a little bit different. What, if, what about this one? Mitt Romney is the former governor of what state? This is not opinion. Mitt Romney is the former governor of what state? Illinois, press A. Massachusetts, press B. Michigan, C. New Hampshire, D. Ohio, E. Several of you choosing not to respond. That is okay. We will close the poll. All right. The Pew Research Center asked this question last week. 60% got it right. You're much better than the average Americans. Congratulations. Very nice. Next question. What state did Barack Obama represent in the U.S. Senate before he became president? Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, Ohio, or New Hampshire? Last week in the Pew poll, 75% of Americans got this right. Let's see how you did. 92% of you. Good job. Next question. Mitt Romney was the CEO of which of these companies? Was it American Motors? Press A. Bain Capital B. General Motors C. Google D. Sears E. When the Pew Research Center asked this question last week, 53% got it right. Let's see how you did. Correct. 70% of you chose the correct answer, Bain Capital. One more current events question. Who is the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court? Is it Stephen Breyer? Press A. Anthony Kennedy? B. William Rehnquist? C. Harry Reid, D. John Roberts, E. And let's see how you did. The, the Pew Center found that only 39% of Americans got this right. We have one former justice here and one uh, non-justice. 51%, just over half, got this right. John Roberts is the Chief Justice. Uh, the American average was 39%. All right, some more questions as you approach the election. As you consider the candidates, which issues are more important? Do you consider domestic issues as more important when selecting the president, like the economy, health care? Press A. 
or are foreign issues like terrorism, the Middle East, more important to you? If that's the case, then press B. We will close the poll. 89% of you said domestic issues, the economy, health care. I believe those issues will be prominent tonight. What is your opinion of the presidential candidates for this year? Are you very satisfied with the choices that we have? Press A. Fairly satisfied, B. Not too satisfied, C. Not satisfied at all, press D. Let's see what your opinion is of both candidates. We will close the poll. All right. 43% uh, of you not too satisfied, so over half of you are in that not too satisfied or not sat satisfied at all category. Which candidate do you think cares more for people like me, would you say? Which candidate cares more for people like you? Barack Obama? Mitt Romney? We're about to close the poll. You said? Wow. Fascinating. It will be interesting to see how tonight's uh, debate changes this. Let's move from which candidate cares more for people like me to this question. Which candidate will do more on jobs? Which candidate will do more or a better job with jobs? Barack Obama, press A. Mitt Romney, press B. You indicated that domestic issues were important, so let's drill home and let's see what you think about this. 61% of you say that Mitt Romney will do better with jobs. We hear a lot about negative campaigning. What is your attitude of negative campaigning? Which is closer to your belief? Is it negative, negative campaigning turns me off? If that's the case, press A. Or negative campaigning does help my judgment of candidates. If that's closer to your belief, press B. What do you think? All right, 70% of you are turned off by negative campaigning. A couple more questions. If the election were held now, Describe how you would vote. Are you definitely leaning toward Obama right now? Press A. Uh, if you're leaning toward Obama, press B. If you're leaning toward Romney, C. Or if you're definitely leaning toward Romney, press D. So if you're definite on either end, press A or D. If you're leaning, indicate that with a B or a C. All right, 46% definitely for Romney. So about uh, eight, uh, 58, 60% of you are leaning toward or definite for Romney. 28% uh, definitely Obama, 13% leaning toward Obama. Let's ask this one. Whom do you expect to win tonight's debate? Whom do you expect to win tonight's debate? And here we go. Pretty even. 55% of you expect Obama, 45% Mitt Romney. Uh, so we'll turn it over to the panel and let's see uh, what they are looking for. Burgess, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, for giving the support of both the Department of 
uh, History, Politics, and Philosophy, and the Department of Communication and Journalism. We thank you, Craig Bledsoe, our provost, for his continuing support of uh, pizza and politics. And finally, we thank Randy Spivey of the Institute for Law, Justice, and Society. You will see all of those entities on your program. Please help me in thanking them for supporting me. This will be the last night that I introduce panelists because we have as an ongoing moderator for our series, Alan Griggs, who has joined us here as executive in residence in the Department of Communication and Journalism. Alan, to all of you students, you know already how terrific he is, but let me tell the community. Some of you will remember Alan as the news director for Channel 4 for 20 years here, an award-winning news director, I should say. And he also won awards for being a news director at an NBC affiliate in Boston as well. He comes to us after a step teaching at TSU and also as the Vice President for Communications of the United Methodist Church. So please join me in welcoming Alan as our ongoing moderator. The two other people on the stage are known to many of you because they have been on the stage before. Lisa Quigley brings to us a, a lifetime of working for moderate Democrats and reaching across the aisle to make things happen in our government. She not only worked for many years for Representative Cooley of California, but then ran for his office, and we all wish she had won, ran for his office uh, after working also for Steny Hoyer, who made, Hoyer from Maryland, who many of you know as the moderate majority, majority leader of the House under Nancy Pelosi. We are so pleased to have her here in Nashville and part time in Washington as the Chief of Staff now to Congressman Jim Cooper. Lisa, thank you for being with us. And finally, the person to her right, for those of you who have noticed, is not Tom Ingram, as previously <laughs> advertised. I told Tom this afternoon, Toby, that we had passed him over since he had this unavoidable conflict. We have passed him over for the next generation of Republican <laughs> leadership in Tennessee. So please help me in welcoming, but first let me tell you about him, one of the 40 under 40 from the Nashville Business Journal this year, a person who has worked not only for Carl Dean, but now works in the Haslam administration uh, in the Department of Economic Development. Please help me welcome Toby Compton, also a Lipscomb grad. Thank you, Toby, for being here. Now, Alan, it's up to you. All right, thank you very much, Linda. And um, we are indeed uh, privileged to have these two panelists here this evening. Good to have you with us. Let me start by saying that the race today is just as tight as it has been now for the whole campaign. The latest polls indicate 49 to 46 Obama, but that's well within the margin of error on the polling, polling going on every day now. What's at stake for the president this evening in this debate? Lisa? You know, I think the president has to um, maintain his composure, show that he's um, a leader, show that he is not um, ruffled by challenges that may come from um, Governor Romney. Um, I think he is going to lay out his case for why he should be reelected. Um, obviously, the last four years have been very, very challenging. I think he'll make the case that it would have been challenging for anyone in that office. Um, I think he has to come out today looking like um, the strong leader that, um, that, that Americans expect. So the challenge for him, I guess, is to try to not make a big mistake, right? I think, I think so. I mean, I think that um, it's going to be, um, these, both, both of these men are extremely experienced. Both of them have been under a great deal of pressure time and again, and I actually don't expect any major um, error that any, either one of them will make. I think that it will come down to um, style, um, how they um, uh, answer the questions that are asked of them. That's really important. Um, Politicians tend to pivot and answer the question that they want to answer rather than ask, answer the question that they are asked. Um, so I think that he has an opportunity to lay out his case, um, and I don't expect to see any major problems with how he presents his, that case tonight. All right, thank you. I'll ask the same question for Toby. Well, I think Governor Robbie uh, obviously had a very spirited primary, uh, 19 debates. 
So he's practiced, he's rehearsed in, in the debate atmosphere. So uh, what we've seen since the convention is uh, a lot of talk about Romney preparing, and clearly he has to do well tonight and articulate his vision and his differences with President Obama. Um, I think that one thing that we'll see is, is, I agree with Lisa completely, I don't think there's gonna be any real big surprises. Um, I think there'll be some probably spirited exchanges. Um, you know, maybe there'll be some gaffe by one of the two men. Um, we'll see, as Anderson Cooper's piece kind of pointed some of those uh, historical pieces out, those historical gaffes out. But I think that um, there's a lot of pressure on Governor Romney to do well. Uh, the thir first 30, the 40 minutes of the debate are going to be key for him. That's so when most people are going to be tuning in, paying attention. That first half of the debate is going to be about the economy. Uh, clearly, he, he is poised uh, and presented himself to be this CEO of sorts, uh, a businessman, a leader. And so he's going to have to, to clearly uh, articulate his vision for what it means to create jobs in America. Well, this debate is about domestic policy only this evening, supposedly. That's what they're limiting themselves to. So, Toby, I turn to you now and we let you go first. Uh, how does each candidate relate to the audience, especially the young audience, regarding the economy? That's such a huge issue. The, the deficit now is over $16 trillion and counting. And so how do they relate in, in very human terms? It, it's going to be tough. It's going to be very tough because each candidate has thrown numbers around uh, for, for everything that one candidate puts, presents, the other candidate has uh, you know, an, an alternate. Um, so it's really tough to really drill down. And I think what Governor Romney has to do tonight, Alan, is I, th I really think he has to uh, present himself as human. He really has to present himself as someone who can relate to other people. Um, he's been presented and, and portrayed a lot as um, for the rich. Uh, clearly, he, he has made a lot of money in his life. Uh, he, he has been uh, blessed by a lot of opportunity, but he's going to have to present himself uh, to a lot of the uh, more middle class voters in America and, and, and gain their trust tonight. It's very difficult to, I mean, these th things that we deal in every day, you know, these, these fiscal concerns and budgets and, and, and this back and forth, it's hard for, for normal folks just tuning in tonight to watch to really absorb that. You know, I think uh, one, I hope that one of the questions that uh, are asked tonight has to do with the so-called fiscal cliff that everybody's hearing a lot about. And, and I don't know, um, I, I haven't met one person that really understands the, the fiscal cliff, and so I just thought I'd take a few moments to explain. This actually doesn't have anything to do with the fiscal cliff, but I did want you to see trends, because I love these charts because it shows um, what percentage of our, our budget was spent on these different priorities in 1970, then 40 years later in 2010. And so when either of the parties are telling you that what the problem is, I think it's really important that we sort of look at the, these are numbers that would be supported by all of my Republican friends. These are uh, indisputable about what we spent and spend annually. And I think one of the most important things is the red piece of this. Um, this is the um, Social Security and Medicare portion. Um, and if you also look at the next um, piece, which is uh, Medicaid, what you see over the 40 years is that we are spending more and more of the percentage of our dollars every year um, taking care of our bodies, right? Medicaid is uh, the health insurance program for the poor. Um, Medicare is self in, uh, self, uh, health insurance program for those over um, the age of 65. And so when uh, Democrats say, oh, you know, they want to cut Medicare, um, well, you know, there uh, are going to have to be some adjustments to Medicare or else we are not going to be able to support anything else in, in our government over the next several decades. And, uh, and, when, uh, and when Republicans say, you know, you can't you know, cut defense, well, I'll just point out that we already spend a lot less of our budget on defense than we did in, in 1970, and that's partly due to technology. Um, but these are sort of the things that I think are the basics that as um, you need to absorb in order to understand you know, what we're talking about when it comes to the choices. Just really quickly on the fiscal, uh, fiscal clip, if I may, it's two parts. It is the Bush tax cuts that were passed um, 12 years ago. They were set to expire two years ago. We were in the middle of a recession, and so Congress and the President said, let's extend them for two years, and they'll expire December 31st, 2012. They will expire on, 2000, on December 31st unless the Congress and the President agree that there's going to be some other formula they might 
allow some of them to go forward, they might allow all of them to go forward. If they allow any of them to go forward, it, it's a cost and it's something that we have to absorb in our budget. Um, the second um, part of the fiscal cliff is that last summer, not 2012, but 2011, we almost um, didn't, but we almost defaulted on our, on our debts as a nation. It would have been the first time in American history that we had done it. It would have put us in the classification of, you know, emerging third world countries. Um, and the Congress and the President um, uh, came up with a deal. If you raise the debt ceiling so we can keep spending money and we don't have enough money but we can't default on our, on our obligations, then we'll take 18 months and we'll figure out the problem as to how to bring down the deficit in the long term. And if we don't, by December 31st, 2012, that same date that the tax cuts are set to expire, then we're going to cut everything across the board. You know, some might argue that that makes a lot of sense, but it also doesn't show a great deal of thinking. It also doesn't reward programs that work, and it also doesn't punish programs that don't work. Um, so this is actually quite scary to both parties um, that these cuts would occur, and it compels everyone to come to the table and try to make some kind of deal on the tax cuts uh, expiring and on these um, uh, cuts going together in something called sequestration, which you may hear a lot about and think, what in the world is that? So those are both happening at the end of the year, which is why you'll see Congress and the President meeting even after the election to try to solve this problem. Good explanation there, and that's something we all need to be aware of because at the end of the year, if nothing is worked out, I believe I saw our taxes could go up average uh, $3,500 a year next year. Is that right? That's a lot of money. So. Let's talk, I, one of the things that I talk to students about, obviously, and counsel them about is finding a job. We have over 8% of Americans now still out of work. That's a lot of people. And a number of people have just sort of given up on finding a job because of the difficulties. So we have two candidates here and two different ways, I suppose, of trying to cure the jobless problem. So Toby, why don't you start with Governor Romney's idea? Governor Romney's presented a five-point plan. A lot of it um, is, is, I think he's committed to about 19 million jobs or something thereabouts um, over a period of five or six years. Um, a lot of it, uh, he, he speaks on clean energy. He speaks on um, fiscal, some fiscal responsibility issues with the country that will help um, um, help business people. Um, it will reduce regulation, which will help business people create more jobs and uh, also tax cuts for across the board. Um, he, the criticism to Governor Romney is cutting those on the, on the wealthy. He, he, he contends that cutting the tax on wealthy helps free up more capital to invest in jobs. Uh, it's a five-point plan. I don't think tonight you're gonna hear anything new. It's too late in the game to really present too many new uh, pieces of that. He'll probably stick to his, his five-point plan and try to present that going forward. Okay, please. No, I would, uh, the president has a jobs plan that was unable to get through Congress this last, this last year, but I would actually say, because I think there's a lot of good ideas in, in, in uh, Governor Romney's plan as well, but what you most hear from business people around the country, and I have the opportunity to meet with CEOs all the time. This was the CEO of Panera Bread a few weeks ago, CEO of some other people that are really uh, making things happen in the job market, and what they'll tell you is that they've never had more money on their balance sheets than they have in history, and they are afraid to spend money because of uncertainty. And that's why some of these things have to be resolved by the end of the year. The fiscal cliff, figuring out the tax cut issue, they are too scared to spend money. They are too scared to use this to, uh, to hire more people, to um, make our economy work again. And so I think that that's the thing that the, that the Congress and the President have to be focused on more than anything. As a business environment, and especially the U.S. business, uh, business person, can adapt to anything, but they cannot adapt to uncertainty. They really want some answers and want to know that we have a competent plan going forward. Okay, good. This has been a very heated uh, uh, contest so far with some people in the public really getting a little perturbed with the charges going back and forth. I want to ask you both if you think that these two gentlemen, who are very prominent in their own ways, can have a civil conversation tonight for the American public. I certainly hope so. I hope that they model what we all want. And I think that's why I appreciate so much being invited to speak at Lipscomb because there is such an emphasis on civility and in um, 
talking through problems and in building relationships with people on the other side of the aisle. Um, I certainly think that that's important for um, our audiences to see, and I think it's a very, very important tonight for the President and for Governor Romney to treat one another with great respect, um, and, and hopefully the public won't see this um, as entertainment, um, rather information. You know, I'll point out that the negative ads that you hear are flooding the airways in some of these states. You know, it's really only down to about nine states where they're uh, getting negative ads all day long. You know, we haven't seen any of those here because uh, Tennessee and Tennessee is going is 99 percent uh, guaranteed to vote for um, to vote for Romney according to Nate Silver's 538 today. I looked it up. 99 percent. Um, and so because of that, there's no advertising going on in Tennessee, and so the debates are actually really important for all those 41 other states that aren't um, aren't getting that advertising day in and day out. And I think people are going to get a lot of information tonight. But can they talk candidly? I, I'd like to hope so. I, I mean, I, both men have prepared uh, for hours going into this. They, they know to some degree what they're going to say and how they're going to position things. Um, hopefully they get candid, and, and Lisa's right, you know, you know, we're kind of blessed in Nashville and in Tennessee in the sense that we do try to work together. I mean, I, I've worked with Lisa and, and, and folks across the aisle many, many times, and, and, and we're able to do that here because we are able to talk and be civil, and we just hope that on the national stage they can continue that and hopefully fairly present themselves, but also have an exchange that's meaningful to the American people. But this is an important event tonight for both men, right? I think it'll be the most watched debate in American history, and I think that um, it's going to be incredibly important um, for those uh, last few independents in the key states who haven't made up their minds, and it's a small number, but um, um, they're who they're talking to tonight. Um, you know, if you are in Colorado, if you are in Florida, if you are in North Carolina or Ohio, you know, they're talking to independents there. Okay. Yeah, it, it really is a do or die time for, for Governor Romney. I, I mean, he has to do well. He has to perform well. Um, you know, there's an expectation that he, he delivers tonight. Um, faltering out of this, he's had a couple rough weeks, I think. Um, coming out of this tonight uh, and not showing well, uh, I think will definitely hurt him in the key battleground states. Um, you know, he's, he's just behind enough of the polls that a really good solid performance tonight just bumps him up just enough and it, it may get even tighter. Any zingers? you expect any zingers tonight? Any unexpected lines coming out that might be planned? Or are they going to hold their ammunition until later? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that they, they prepare for lots of things, and but um, I think rarely do those moments come. I think that um, these are really smart guys, and I think that they're used to talking on their feet, and they seize a moment when they think the opportunity is right, and um, I don't think that they're going to do anything that would in, in, endanger, um, you know, uh, their performance along the way. So um, they're, they're, both, they're both pretty conservative in terms of how they relate to, uh, to others. Uh, in a, in a way that some of our uh, other presidents and presidential <coughs> candidates have been a little bit less cautious. Any last thoughts? Uh, uh, same thing. I, as I think they're going to be really reserved for the most part. If there's an, if there's an open door, either man could, could try to run through that and, and have a zinger out there. But I think they're going to be pretty moderated in their approach. Governor Romney, all through the, uh, the, the primaries, really kind of reined back. You know, there's only a handful of times he ever was on the attack. Um, I think President Obama will do very good job. He's, he's fast on his feet. He's witty. He relates well with people. Okay, folks, you're going to be watching history being made this evening. Keep in mind that the debate is divided into six segments. The first three are about the economy, an overwhelmingly important topic, obviously. Then health care, and then the role of government, and finally governing itself, the quality of the leadership. So for you students out there, watch for the nonverbal communication especially, not just the verbal communication. Watch for the body language. Look for the size, the Al Gore size, if you will. Look for the roll of the eyes. Look for the use of the arms, the emphatic use of the arms. And, and see how the candidates communicate in that regard in, the, in addition to what they're saying. Take some good notes and we'll be back with you at the end of the debate. Thank you. If you'll, get, if you'll get your uh, clickers ready, we will uh, get ready to fire those up again in just a moment. While we get those ready, some uh, trending on Twitter right now. Uh, making, his way, making its way up the last hour has been Big Bird. 
a trending topic that has been purchased by Romney is now at the top. Can't afford four more uh, is at the top. Another trending topic right now is Jim Lehrer, the moderator. <laughs> Notice that uh, one person said, uh, is Jim Lehrer, uh, Jim Lehrer is the Dick Clark of debates. Uh, isn't he still, isn't he dead yet? Uh, one person said, um, Jim Lehrer is the replacement refs of debates. <laughs> so uh, we'll hear about that tonight. Let's go to, uh, let's go to the next question. Hope you have your clickers at, your, at hand. Who won? Who won? Barack Obama, press A. Mitt Romney, press B. Give about five more seconds until we close the poll. And you said 63% Rip Mitt Romney, 37% Barack Obama. Let me pull up the graph from earlier uh, when we asked who did you think would win the debate. 55% uh, said Barack Obama, 45% Mitt Romney. All right, if the election were held now, describe how you would vote. We asked this before the debate. Now, if you will, answer it right now. Definitely for Obama, press A. Leaning toward Obama, press B. Leaning toward Romney, press C. Definitely Romney, press D. About five more seconds. All right, 49% definitely for Romney, 11% uh, leaning, 11% leaning toward Obama, 29% uh, definitely for Obama. Let me pull up the graph from before the debates. The blue represents before, ranging from the left Obama to the right, Romney, and here's after. I'll try to put both of these graphs on the screen and we'll turn things over to Alan and the panel. Well, let the uh, Monday morning quarterbacking begin. Um, let's talk about it, guys. Winners, losers. The American public is always interested in who wins, who doesn't win, if anything sticks as far as what was said. Start with you, Toby. Well, you know, going into it, uh, we, neither of us believed that there would be a lot of um, fireworks, but they certainly went after each other uh, by name from, from the get-go. Uh, I think, you know, obviously I'm going to be biased here. This is where my partisan, I guess, nature comes out. And I think Romney was prepared. Um, I, th I think he looked good. He, he, uh, he came off well. There were times when he started speaking a little too fast, trying to get too many points in. But I think he did a good job of laying out an articulate vision of, of one candidate versus the other, uh, their approach to government. Um, some, of the, some of the economy stuff got a little bottled up. It got, you know, they were doing the, the five trillion and the two trillion. It's, you know, let's add a few more zeros, you know. It's, I think it, it just got jumbled up. Um, every comedy writer in America has to be working on the Big Bird comment. I mean, that, that was, that's, just, that's just a gem. Um, but, you know, I think, um, I, I, you know, I think that Romney probably won by a little bit. It was probably that he exceeded expectation. Uh, Obama looked pretty good. I, I did find the tweet. The tweet that I saw going on a lot was uh, the Bill, Bill Mayer tweets that y'all probably all already seen. Um, he kept saying that Obama needs a teleprompter, and he said Obama made a lot of good points tonight. Unfortunately, most of them were for Romney. So, you know, <laughs> that was kind of the buzz that was going out there that I saw, and I've been trying to pull up some stuff, but it's too soon. Keep working on that and see what you find. Lisa, what about you? I, so I took notes throughout and I, and I thought, uh, first of all, overall, um, you know, wow, spent so much time about uh, on budget and health care and that's because the whole 
the whole game is budget and healthcare, right? Like the budget problems are healthcare problems, the healthcare problems are budget problems, and so that's why they spent so much time. And this was a debate about domestic issues, and they moved very uh, hardly at all beyond those. Um, Dodd Frank, which like no real people, normal people know anything about. So I think it was simply proxy for sort of Wall Street, anti Wall Street kind of thing. But I mean, I, I didn't think you know regular folks or voters would find that you know a particularly moving argument. So I took notes on both of them, and I, you know I, what I thought about um, about Obama is I thought he looked like a professor, not a president. Um, I thought his eyes were down. You know, I wish that he had somebody that might have been texting him saying, like, could you just look up, you know? Um, they, I thought he was um, too wordy. I didn't think he was um, thematic. And he's actually good at thematic um, um, arguments. I thought Bill Clinton was writhing in pain on the floor somewhere, like wondering <laughs> why can't you know, either one of these guys do a, uh, you know, a job of explaining these complicated issues in a way people can understand. Yep. Um, and so then on Romney, you know, I thought that he was earnest. Um, I, thought, I thought that his gaze uh, was effective, that he looked at Romney and, I mean, I'm sorry, he looked at the president and, and listened, and I thought that was effective. Um, I thought he came off as friendly. I thought he got off to a great start with his um, most romantic place you could imagine being with, was with me. I thought that was a great, you know, um, Kickoff. Um, I thought he really held his own, which means he, he won, um, because I think it's difficult to hold your own with a sitting president. Um, I thought he was a tiny bit of a debate bully. Um, I thought, especially for women voters, you know, you would have you know been kind of been going, I got it. You know, like you don't have to say it over and over again louder, like his sons, as he was describing his son saying something over and over again until it came true. Um, so, I agree with that last point a lot too, he, uh, Romney. Romney, try, Jim Lehrer did a good job, and there's a lot of people saying he didn't. He did a good job because he let them go at it, and he and he he was able to remove himself and let them kind of spar, which was good you to really see. You really think he did a good job? See, yeah. I thought he lost control of this thing early. A, a little bit, but no, I think, I think that he, he lost a lot to myself. But, but no, this I, is, I, I thought this it was is good. where the great American public has I, all of its opinions. I yeah, really no, think, I think he lost good. that thing at the beginning. I, he probably should have been a little more. Um, um, on the time, but I think he did a good job of letting them go after each other a little bit and letting people kind of see who, who was who. I thought that was good, but I thought that, that Romney did come off a little a little loud. He had to be the last person to speak every time. Uh, I didn't think that was really good. But did he, did you, because of that, do you think he went into this thinking he really had nothing to lose and everything to gain by being aggressive? Because I thought he was pretty aggressive. Yeah, uh, that clearly was the strategy. So he could have really lost something had that backfired on him, but I don't think it did tonight anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking um, earlier today what would happen if, um, if Romney did really well, beat expectations, was sort of um, the, the winner, um, uh, uh, so to speak. And so I looked back at Nate Silver's 538, which if any wants in the room, like, you know, just wake up every morning and go to Nate Silver 538. Every Democrat, every Republican I know does. So, you know, this is sort of where I'm getting the information. It's not original research of my own. So I just want to make sure that, sure that that's clear, too. But I looked at bumps over 2% after a debate of challengers against sitting presidents, right? So uh, to see what would happen. So um, Ford had a 3% bump after the debate. Uh, in 1976, lost to President Carter. Um, Mondale had a 3.6 um, bump after the debate in 1984, lost to President Reagan. Um, and uh, Senator Kerry had a 3% bump in 2004, lost to President Bush. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's on both sides. You know, it's not, a, it's not a D or an R thing. It goes to both. The, the one exception um, was that, uh, that Reagan got a 2.8% bump off of a debate in 1980 and won against President Carter. And I, I think that that was a you know, clear example of an exceptional um, debater and personality who was able to then you know, sort of parlay that beyond the debate. Um, so uh, having said this, and who knows what you all think, um, I hate when people tell me what I'm supposed to think, you know, so I'm sure you all have things to make not agree with us at all, but my, my sense is, is that Obama, uh, the Romney is going to get a, 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 a bit of a bump off of this, and then the next question is, so how does that really um, play a role then in the result of the election? All right, quickly, a lot of buzz about middle class. Middle class, middle class, middle class. Uh, are they just posing for this, or do they sincerely believe this? 
I, mean, I hope they sincerely believe it. I mean, it's, it it's hard to say. Uh, I thought Romney did a pretty good job speaking to middle class issues. Um, I, I thought he used some, I thought he did a good job of bringing in the private sector and discussing that, uh, which I think will relate well to, to some of the middle class voters. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that you, you can't get through a debate like this without repeatedly talking about the largest segment of the electorate, um, and which is often lost in these debates where you spend so much time um, with a focus on the very, um, the very poor um, and in those that have, uh, are, are very wealthy. And so they, I think they both did a pretty good job of integrating you know, that priority. Okay. Uh, any other statements or words stand out from either candidate tonight that, that might be remembered down the road? Well, you know, the economy stuff was so important, but the, I think the, the, the section that we got to tonight in the debates that I wish they'd spent more time on was the philosophy of government, because I think it is a, a, a bit of a difference between the two candidates. Um, and I, think, I wish they'd spent more time there discussing that. Uh, I thought Romney was actually fairly prepared for that section and did a good job. Um, I think that uh, the president didn't really look very comfortable in that particular section. And that's kind of when some of the comments on Twitter were they wish that he had the teleprompter and he was kind of looking down. One thing I will say about stylistically, one thing that Obama did that I really liked uh, was he looked directly in the camera several times in yeah. making a direct appeal. Yeah. And, and Romney didn't do that until the very end in his closing statement. And, and, and it, it was kind of interesting to see, but, you know, when Obama had a certain message, he looked straight on and delivered it. Yeah. And Romney never did that. He was either looking at the president or the moderator. Yeah. That's a good point. We have time for comments from the gallery out here. Anybody want to have a question? Anybody have a question and want to make a comment? Yes, sir. I think I was disappointed with Jim here, too. I think he lost control. But I wonder, I don't think, I think a lot of his questions were really vague and they weren't designed really to flesh out more specific information. I, I wanted to know more about specific cuts. They, the, uh, the, the deductions that, that, that Governor Romney was proposing. Um, I, I wish I would have heard someone challenge uh, uh, Governor Romney on the $716 billion cuts in Medicare. But, uh, but, but I, I just wondered if, if you thought the questions were, were designed to really be vague or, or, if, or if you would fall to uh, Jim Lehrer a little bit because they weren't really designed to elicit more specific response you know, I, I think what he did is gave, gave them wide berth. You know, I think they could have decided how to deal with these questions and been more specific, and they, they, they weren't. They didn't take the opportunity, I don't think, either one of them very well to sort of frame, here's the problem, right, and here's how I'd solve it, and here are the choices that are involved. And, and I think the American public is smart enough you know, to be able to, you know, make a, dis a decision and understand that, that there is no easy button, right? So um, I think if you'd been a little bit more specific, then you would have tended to um, make those questions, um, you know, designed to provoke, um, you know, sort of the food fight. Um, so I, I, I thought actually the questions were fine. I just don't think that, you know, um, they're both they're both very wonky guys, right? You know, they've spent. I think in some ways they might have both been a bit over rehearsed. Um, you know, you sometimes wonder, as four days in the bunker, you know, before a debate, does it really help? Um, Good point. Now, I, I, you know, what you said earlier about Clinton somewhere. You know, Clinton was so good at articulating a very simple message, and neither of them really did that tonight. But to the, the point about Lair's questions, I. You know, how many times we've we seen debates where they do ask the specific question and the candidate kind of hears it and it goes one in and out the other and they say what they want. So I think, yeah, he gave them a wide berth. He let them go at it. Now, you know, I kind of enjoyed that. I, you know, I kept wondering, I kept thinking that the next question would be specific. And it was all these, you know, it's these, you know, professorial kind of questions that, you know, students get asked, you know, you know, compare and contrast, you know, that was doing that. I thought that was interesting. Question? Oh, we're going to hear from the fact checkers. Tonight. There were a lot of uh, statistics and things thrown out that uh, didn't make sense to me. Well, I think it's a great question, and I, I'm certain that there will be no shortage of, um, of fact checking going on. And, and specifically, um, for example, the, the um, uh, t uh, plan that um, 
that Governor Romney talked about with uh, cutting seven, 716 billion from, from Medicare. Um, you know, I think that you'll learn a lot more about what that, that is. That was actually part of um, uh, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Um, I think that um, the plans that, the, that Obama talked about that Romney has for um, um, uh, taxes and, and sort of the choices that, um, that, that he would make, um, I think it left the, uh, the viewer confused about who is telling the truth, and I think that's where the fact checkers are going to come in, you know, handy tomorrow and be able to sort of um, validate um, what both of them were saying, and um, hopefully you'll all be, you know, tuned in for that, too. I, I looked online at a few, a few spots, and, you know, Drudge and Huffington Report, you know, uh, Politico, and they were already doing some fact checking stuff out there, and if you flip on Fox or CNN when you get home, you know, you're, you're going to hear plenty of spin and fact checking yeah, and things like that. There'll be plenty of that. Yeah, no tomorrow, doubt. For sure. Because there were because there were so many, particularly in that first 30 minutes, there was so much back and forth about five trillion, two trillion. It, it, it's going to be, it's so hard for people to wade through that and just digest that in, in the little sound bites that they were giving. Other questions? During the RNC and the DNC, the statistics that showed that people who actually paid attention to the speeches and to the conventions were very low due to other um, channels and things along those lines. Do you think that will play a part tonight? You said um, Mr. Romney won this debate tonight, and his polls are showing that he is down in his numbers, but still within the margin. So do you think that this debate will help him in any way in that regard, or do you think that people were watching other shows. Well, there, there were a lot of people watching other shows, I assure you. Um, but, you know, I, I think that this probably was a very well-watched debate. You know, the statistics show that the first 30 to 45 minutes are what most Americans would kind of tolerate. And so, you know, perhaps the unfortunate thing is um, th they saw the economy stuff, and for a lot of people, they go, well, what was that? They didn't, they didn't understand it. Um, Romney probably walks away with a little bit of a bump in the polls. Um, I personally wouldn't dig into that too much because it really comes down to those key battleground states. It'll be really more interesting to dig down and see how he did in those states. And even more interesting to see, you know, when you poll, uh, there's cross tabs in there. It'll be really more interesting to see how his responses and how the debate went in certain key demographics within those states. You know, that's, that's, that'll be several days before we're able to really get that stuff out. And that'll kind of tell you where this, where this really was, I think. Given what happened tonight, what is going to be their strategy for the next debate, do you think, for each gentleman? Obama's going to look up more. He's not going to have his head down as much, and I think that he's going to um, attempt to um, be more thematic. Um, you know, he's the president, and he's, presidents are required to inspire and lead. and. Um, tonight felt like a, deb a debating society, which is perfectly fine for an academic exercise, but it, it wasn't um, you know, particularly inspiring. Now, having, having said that, um, and just to um, make a, one point that I thought today is if, if Tennessee you know, uh, voters might be watching this and, and, and might be looking at this sort of the role of government thing, and, and given that, that Tennessee will, will undoubtedly vote overwhelmingly for uh, Governor Romney, you know, you know, remember that you have to balance that with what those swing states are. You know, you might you might not agree with the the role of government uh, personally, or or that that would play in in our state. Um, but if you look at those states that are, um, you know, just just four weeks ago, there were ten states that were really totally toss up states, and eight of them right now are polling consistently for the president and. Two of them are polling consistently for um, Romney. So, you know, North Carolina and Missouri are, you know, really going for Ro o Romney at this point. And and then l look at the patterns in these states: Nevada, Colorado, Florida, uh, and 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 Ohio. And those four states, um, in particular, um, if you look at one particular demographic demographic is that they have a high percentage of Latino voters, and um, which is something that's uh, you know completely different um, from the state of Tennessee. So, so a lot of the appeal that the president was making about education and about 
you know, the role of government, um, you know, was with, with that audience in mind. And, and he needs to keep those in his uh, column, which appear to be in his column now. But again, we still have a month uh, left to go before the election. Colby, are we going to see the same Governor Romney in the next debate? It's hard to know. I mean, you know, when you look at the primaries and, and who showed up, there were different Romneys at different debates. And so I think he'll have to achieve so, if, or find his, his voice. Uh, he's going to have to synthesize uh, really complicated things down a little better than he did tonight uh, to continue to win. It's really hard for an incumbent president because they are so, you know, when you're president, you're so unaccustomed to someone having the last word or someone challenging you. Point. Yeah. And uh, that, and that's, I think, why Obama felt uncomfortable. And I think Obama will feel more comfortable in the next debate now, now that this has happened. And, and I, th I think that's what will happen. So Romney's going to do well. They have to position uh, Ryan to do well against uh, the vice president. And, 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 and they hope that if, 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 if that were to happen, they get on a roll and it makes it a little easier, perhaps, for Romney to step into the second debate. Any final questions? We've covered everybody? One more day. I'm sorry? Paul Simpson was referenced several times in the debate. Any of you that haven't read it or like a copy of it, I've got a limited number of them sitting over here on the table. Can I also say, this is Tim Paglieri, who is um, from Franklin, Tennessee, and is a absolute leader in this country on trying to advance the um, Simpson Bowles um, plan, which um, a, a lot of, um, of folks in the middle, in the political middle, um, think is the answer to solving um, the long-term deficit problems. And Tim has taken it upon himself to um, lead and spend his own resources and time to sort of spread the message. And so um, he's um, a real um, leader in his own right. And thank you for being here today. Let's thank our panel.